Ah, Freddy Krueger, the original burned face man. A creepy little fella who loves sneaking into your dreams and absolutely ruining them. And I'm not just talking about pantsing you as you're playing on stage in front of thousands of people, but actually doing that and then stabbing you for good measure as well. Now, you might think that over the years and on repeated viewings that you know everything there is to know about Freddy Krueger. Well, I'm just going to say, mate, look at the title of this video. Come on, come on, let's go. As I'm Jules, this is WhatGulch.com, and these are 10 things you didn't know about Freddy Krueger. Number 10. Robert Englund came extremely close to not playing Freddy in the sequel. Freddy Krueger and Robert Englund are pretty much synonymous. He made the role his own time and time again, from Craven's original film all the way through to 2003's Freddy vs. Jason. It's surprising then that at one time the movie executives didn't feel all that strongly about the actor. After the success of the first Elm Street, a sequel was quickly greenlit and Englund believed that he deserved more money, rightfully so, to reprise the role. Both the actor and his agent realised how crucial he was to the role of Freddy, and they figured that New Line wouldn't dare recast the part the way that Paramount did with Jason after every Friday the 13th film, so they indeed asked for way more money to return in Nightmare 2, but New Line was having none of it. The powers that be didn't think that England was really all that important to the role, reasoning that anyone playing Freddy is pretty much just a dude under a rubber mask. They ultimately hired a stunt guy to play Kruger, which had some terrible results, so the studio quickly relented and thankfully paid him what he originally wanted. Number 9. Jackie Earl Haley almost starred in the original. The 2010 reboot introduced the world to Jackie Earl Haley as the new Freddy, and while he did an admirable job, he just wasn't Freddy. It's not his fault, nobody could match up to Rob. But what many people don't know is that there's long been a rumour that Haley was actually set up to star in the original Nightmare on Elm Street film 20 years plus prior. He was apparently up for the part of Glenn, which would ultimately be Johnny Depp's first film role. The story goes that Johnny accompanied his friend Jackie on Jackie's audition for the movie. Director Wes Craven saw Depp, asked him to audition, and Jackie Jackie went on to do something called the Zoo Gang instead. While other people involved with the film have said that the actor did indeed audition, the overall story may not actually be what it seems. You see, in an interview with Movies Online, the actor explained, It is possible that I auditioned for Nightmare on Elm Street and don't remember. It's also possible that I could have been sitting next to Johnny in the waiting room. That's the only thing I could figure where that started from. Either way, it's still a pretty big coincidence. Number 8. Robert Englund recently donned his Freddy makeup for the last time for a good cause. Now, for anyone hoping to see old Rob don his Freddy makeup once again, it seems quite unlikely at this point. But a few years back, he decided to wear the makeup one final time as he attended a horror convention in the Chicago area called Flashback Weekend. The actor is something of a staple of the convention circuit, but this time he actually showed up as Freddy and he did it for a really good cause. All the proceeds from the event went towards the Midway Drive-In Digital Fund, a funding drive to buy the Dixon Illinois Drive-In a digital projector to go along with its 35mm setup. This will help them present more classic horror films festivals as well as work towards the preservation and operation of the American drive-in experience. A trip to the Midway is apparently like entering a time capsule to the 1950s. So why does Robert have such a love for old school drive-ins? Well, apparently he lost his virginity at one, and that sounds like a good enough reason to us. Number 7. He has an insane Bollywood counterpart. If there's one film industry that can rival Italy when it comes to throwing copyrights and intellectual properties to the wind, it would be Bollywood. The films from this South Asian region are notorious for ripping off other films and plagiarising everything from plots to music. This was especially a rampant trend in previous decades as the isolated nature of the Hindi film industry rarely clued anyone in. Because of this, the Ramsey brothers, considered the kings of Indian horror, were able to beat Platinum Dunes to the punch by 17 years when they ripped off and remade A Nightmare on Elm Street. Dubbed Mahakal, the Ramsey's film introduced Indian audiences to a character ridiculously similar to Craven's dream-stalking madman. In short, have you ever wondered what it would be like if Freddy travelled to India and slaughtered a bunch of young college kids? Well, probably not, but if you're among the two psychos that said yes, well, you needn't wonder any longer. This film is all of that and more. It also throws in some local mysticism into the mix for good measure. Oh, and also, there's a Michael Jackson impersonator as well. It is quite ridiculous. Number 6. He once checked George H.W. Bush. Kinda. DC Follies was a short-lived show in the 80s put together by Sid and Marty Croft that featured satire of politics via puppets, and in one episode, episode, Freddy appears in three very odd segments over the half-hour runtime. In the first one, he threatens to murder President George H.W. Bush until it's explained that if he does that, Dan Quayle would be president. Freddy realises the ramifications and suddenly wakes up from a nightmare, deciding that he'll stick to just terrorising teenagers instead. Freddy is later shown sitting at a table with a puppet of Tammy Faye Baker, where the two realise that they're ultimately very similar. The skit ends with Jim Baker popping in and mistakenly kissing Freddy. And at the end of the show, once all the puppet characters are 
cleared out, Freddy reflects for a bit. He's feeling a bit low about how he'll only be remembered for a pile of dead teenagers and not for his other talents. Freddy is soon reminded about the time that he sang at Madonna and Sean Penn's wedding and how there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Soon Freddy feels better and goes off to maim a cat. Again, it's very weird. Number 5. He once had succulent breasts In the third entry of the Nightmare on Elm Street series, Freddy takes his dream-stalking skills away from Elm Street to Weston Hills, a psychiatric hospital for the youth. In one of the most memorable moments of the film, Joey, a mute, unaware that he's still asleep, is seduced by the beautiful nurse who caught his eye earlier on in the story. The two find a place where they can get intimate and slowly but surely, the nurse reveals herself to the lucky kid. Joey begins kissing her but then notices her tongue getting inhumanely long. Just then, Joey realizes that this nurse isn't a nurse at all, it's actually Freddy in disguise. Suddenly, in his dream, Joey's bed disappears and beneath is a gateway to a fiery hell. As disturbing as this scene already is, the uncomfortableness would have been ratcheted up a few thousand notches if it had played out as originally intended. You see, originally the nurse's head would have morphed into Freddy's. So you would have had a topless woman wearing a very convincing Freddy mask extending down to just above her breasts. And they actually went so far as to film it with their actress in full makeup, but ultimately everybody agreed that something about it wasn't right. Number 4. His most iconic line was actually improvised So let's talk about Dream Warriors and turn our attention to what is arguably the best of the worst puns ever spoken by Kruger. And we come to the fate of Jennifer, the aspiring actress in the gang of hospitalized teen misfits, who is having trouble not sleeping and decides to watch a little late night television by herself in the TV room. Despite putting cigarettes out on her arm in order to stay awake, she eventually falls asleep. While watching the Dick Cavett show on TV, she notices Freddy appear on the screen briefly. She approaches the television, unaware that she's dreaming, and as she advances, the TV sprouts arms and Freddy's head appears. The arms lift her off the ground as Freddy leaves her with the immortal words, Welcome to prime time, bitch. He then slams her head into the TV screen, fatally electrocuting her. As great as it was, the actual scripted line was simply, This is it, Jennifer, your big break on TV. Robert Englund delivered it as scripted the first couple of takes, but then improvised the Welcome to prime time, bitch. And director Chuck Russell decided to use both the scripted and improvised lines, editing the two together. Number 3. He's a certified porn star Nightmare on Elm Street has a perfect setup for parody. Freddy comes into your dreams to kill you, so having that tie into the obvious wet dream experience leads to the sweet adult hybrid known as a wet dream on Elm Street. The film opens with a young woman dreaming about having all sorts of sex with a very well-endowed gentleman. Twenty plus minutes later, she wakes up next to Freddy. Some hilarious banter is exchanged as she mistakes him for Edward James Olmos, to which he responds, why can't anyone ever mistake me for a burned Brad Pitt? In a later flashback sequence, the audience is regaled with the story of Freddy, who is now portrayed as a creep who sold sex toys out of the trunk of his car. When his customer base found out that he was overcharging and misrepresenting his products, there was hell to pay. After being burnt from the waist up, Freddy vowed vengeance. So now several years later, he's back and he's sporting a four dildoed love glove. Okay. <laughs> Number two, there is officially a Freddy Krueger day. In 1991, when Freddy's Dead The Final Nightmare was released, the studio thought that it was indeed the end of Freddy, just the same way that everybody making Friday the 13th The Final Chapter or Halloween 2 thought that they had a front row seat to the final deaths of Jason Voorhees and Michael Myers respectively. So naturally, New Line went all out to bid their landmark antagonist farewell. In fact, as a sly marketing ploy, New Line got the city of Los Angeles to declare September the 12th, the day before the release of Freddy's Dead, to be Freddy Krueger Day. It was a way of promoting the city of Los Angeles as well as celebrating Nightmare on Elm Street, which, unlike other notable horror franchises, had filmed every entry of the series in Los Angeles, employing plenty of local labor and returning money back into the area. Now, some folks didn't like the idea at the time. Does that mean you could celebrate by going out and stabbing and killing somebody? Asked the director of the Los Angeles Alliance for Survival, a Venice anti-violence group. Well, no is the answer to that. No, it, it's still illegal. Come on, dude. Why are you asking that? And while it's not clear how official this day still is, for horror fans, it's official enough. And number one, Adam Sandler once derailed a Freddy Krueger prequel. Now, Adam Sandler's films have been called a great many things, most of them bad, very bad, and not good. But some early ones were decent, but most are not. And you can also add director John McNaughton to the list of the funny man's detractors. You see, in an interview with Bloody Disgusting, the Henry portrait of a serial killer director had some not-so-nice things to say about Sandler, blaming him for mucking up an exciting premise that he had for a prequel to the original Nightmare on Elm Street, namely that it would be Freddy and his 
days spent in hell. He said, New Line had just made, what's his name, the comedian that gets so little respect and makes so much money. It was one of his goofy comedies, Little, Little Nicky something or other. There were a number of scenes in hell and it was his first comedy that didn't do too well. New Line just didn't want to go back to hell, McNaughton concluded, so I basically told them to go to hell. Just the idea of being under the thumb of the studio and being called on to satisfy genre expectations is not something that would make me happy. They were unwilling to go to hell with me and it just came apart. So if anyone out there is upset that this movie doesn't exist, you pretty much have the Sandman to thank for this. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 things you didn't know about Freddy Krueger. I hope you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Instagram, where it's at RetroJ, but the O is a zero. Hope to see you over there. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Hope you're treating yourself well, or at least better than Freddy Krueger would treat you if he was in your dreams. In fact, I hope that you achieve all of your life's dreams, and I hope that you're starting each and every day by reminding yourself that you're an absolute ledge, that you deserve love, happiness, and success, and that no one has the right to tell you otherwise, all right? Now go out there and smash it today. I believe in you. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.